everyone. A very good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for this afternoon's panel discussion on energy security and Afghanistan, prospects for regional connectivity and resource development under the Taliban. This panel discussion is jointly organized by the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISIS, and the Energy Studies Institute at the National University of Singapore. Before we proceed with the discussion, we will appreciate it if the audience could mute their videos and microphones through the session. If you have any questions or feedback to share, please forward them via the Zoom chat. We will compile your questions and comments for the panel to answer. This afternoon, we are delighted to have with us speakers from both the academic and private sectors to share their thoughts on the implications for the energy security of Afghanistan and its neighboring countries following the Taliban takeover in August. Today's panel discussion is chaired by Dr. Imran Ahmad, visiting research fellow at ISS, and joining him as a discussant is Dr. Christopher Led, senior research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute. For the first part of the panel, we have Dr. Yu Ka Ho, a principal analyst in Asia politics and energy at Veris Maple Cross Singapore. And we have Dr. Maza Sadaka Huda, postdoc research fellow at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe Academy, based in Kyrgyzstan. They will speak on the various ongoing energy projects and resource developments in Afghanistan and its neighbors. Following after, we have Mr. Andrew Small, Senior Transatlantic Fellow at the Asia Program in German Marshall Fund of US, and Dr. Ramakrishna Prahan, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Fakhar Mohan University based in India. They will discuss the role of external actors and the regional politics and dynamics in shaping Afghanistan's potential for resource development. It is now my honor to invite Dr. Christopher Lan to give his introduction remarks. Dr. Christopher, please. Uh, good evening from Singapore. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Christopher Lan. Uh, Dr. Philip Andrew Spee is unable to join us today. Uh, he was supposed to be here to make the introductory remarks. So I apologize on his behalf. So in his place, uh, I will make some brief uh, remarks instead. The Energy Studies Institute has been cooperating with the Institute of South Asian Studies since uh, 2017. We have done a number of events on energy transition trends in South Asia and published a book on this topic in 2019. The volume, uh, the edited volume was an early milestone for us. And earlier this year, we also looked at energy cooperation and geopolitics in the Bay of Bengal and published uh, an event report. The two institutes are always looking to do more together. So I'm very pleased that we are doing a webinar today on a very current and hot topic. We are looking at energy security in Afghanistan, focusing on the prospects for regional connectivity and resource development under the Taliban. The situation is still very fluid in Afghanistan, so I really appreciate the speakers taking time to provide us with a snapshot of the current situation. The speakers will focus on regional energy projects involving Afghanistan and its neighbors, and the prospects for resource development in the country. They will also talk about the key external actors and their roles in shaping the regional dynamics. I'm keeping my remarks short so that we have more time for presentations and Q&A. So on behalf of both institutes, I will end my remarks by thanking the speakers for making time to share their views with us. I would also like to thank the audience for attending this event. And now I will hand the session over to the chairperson. Imran, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lin, for those uh, opening remarks. Hello from Singapore. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers and audience for joining us in this important discussion. I'll just make a few comments, perhaps, to set the scene uh, before handing the floor to our speakers. Uh, Afghanistan, we know, is an important link in energy mega, mega projects between South and Central Asia, which promise benefits to the economies and peoples in their millions across the 
re across both regions. Uh, such projects, uh, as we look to discuss and analyze over the next hour and a half or so, uh, also promise to bring income, infrastructure, and energy to Afghanistan itself. So it was, it was quite telling that when the Taliban were first asked about how Afghanistan will rebuild itself, its state and its economy, just days after their takeover of Kabul in mid-August, Suhail Shaheen, the spokesman for the group, noted that abundant natural resources, foreign investment, human capital, Afghanistan's geography as the bridge between South and Central Asia, and Afghanistan as a transit point of energy and connectivity projects, for example, the Tapi gas pipeline, is the key to ensuring the country's path to revival and future prosperity. While the Taliban have ongoingly signaled that they and Afghanistan are open for business and eager for international engagement, the question, of course, is who, why, and when, or if neighboring states, regional powers, and, and the international community will take them up on this offer. The reality, of course, as Dr. Len mentioned, is very fluid. Afghanistan faces a complex array of interconnected political, economic, security, and humanitarian crises, and the grim situation does not look to be subsiding anytime soon, let alone find lasting resolution. What all of this means for energy cooperation and security in the region, as well as the prospects, challenges, ge and geopolitics of the mega energy resource mining and infrastructure projects is central to our discussion today, as well as the optics, ethics, and risks of working or doing business with the Taliban. To help us make some sense of this and other questions, we have a very distinguished panel of experts. And our panel is divided into two. The first two speakers will address energy and resource developments, and the, and the next two speakers will speak on the external actors and regional dynamics. Just a quick note on housekeeping. Um, each of the panelists will speak for about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. Then Dr. Len will be our discussant. Uh, we're privileged to have him make some comments on the presentations. And once that takes place, uh, our panelists will respond to some of those comments. Um, and then we can open the floor for Q&A. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Kaho. Uh, so you have the floor. Thank you all. Uh, my pleasure to join the session. Uh, let me share my screen first. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Um, I guess many of you are aware of the recent political dynamics changes at Afghanistan. There are a lot of discussion around how the country, or, I mean, the changes may affect the fate of the Tapi gas pipeline. And today I would like to share my view on this uh, issue. So first of all, uh, I will try to explain the development background of TAPI in case uh, someone is not really aware about it. And then I will look at why Taliban desperately won this project and what are the challenges ahead. So my presentation is quite brief and I uh, want to uh, have, a, have a content page and a, and a map here for us to navigate. So the pipeline is um, a transnational pipeline running across four countries, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. It is expected to export 33 BCM of natural gas a year. And this is a huge volume. Um, they have been discussing the pipeline for decades and they started the construction in 2015. And for Afghanistan, they start their session in 2018. And actually the benefits are quite clear, at least on paper. So, so let's say for India and Pakistan, there are big gas markets, they need the gas, their demand, and India need an alternative supply option. And for Pakistan, they also uh, want to take the transit fee as well. 
And for Turkmenistan, uh, the, the benefit is even bigger as a gas seller. They, of course, they want to increase their gas export. And more importantly is that, you know, uh, Turkmenistan is kind of a landlocked uh, country, and they have been relying on a small number of uh, gas buyers. Russia, China, actually, there are not much option for them. So when they are with Russia, then they try to diversify the gas supply to China. And now they are with China. They are heavily depending on gas export to China, and that's why they want to export it uh, uh, to, to another country. And that's why they desperately want the capital gas pipeline. And for Afghanistan, and it is pretty straightforward as well. Of course, they want the transit fee, which could be kind of a fresh money injecting into the uh, economy. And they also need the, some of those energy supply and also the infrastructure and investment as well. And for many, many years, um, security is the biggest uh, obstacle for, for this project. And the question here is, will the changes in Afghanistan kind of uh, alter the future of TAPI? Or in other words, will a Taliban victory advance TAPI? In one regard, the answer is somehow yes, from a security perspective. I'm not saying that it is going to ease those obstacle, but at least in the past, the Taliban was considered to be a security threat in the region. And that's why uh, the TAPI is kind of located in a very unstable, unstable uh, region. But now when Taliban takes over, uh, actually they really want the project and that's why they have said a few times that they're going to support the, the project. And this somehow is some of the security uh, concern. And why do they need this project? And it is not just kind of about taking money from the transition and things like that. The TAPI is actually a flagship project in the region. It is a very really mega project. The energy project, and this will speak to the world well that the investment stability is okay in Afghanistan. So this is just like the name card of, of, the, of the region or for, for the new government. And more, more importantly is that um, Afghanistan is not just a war-torn region. It also lacks a lot of basic infrastructure, including energy infrastructure, for example, the power generation facilities and the distribution network and things like that. So if there are a pipeline building in this country, then it will also bring in a lot of other infrastructure investment. And this could somehow help the country to rebuild a lot of the basic infrastructure and also the economy. And for example, the, pipe, uh, the TAPI pipeline is going to be constructed in two phases. In the first one, it is more about the work to be done in terminus time. And in the second phase, if everything is going on as expected, then there will be uh, 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 some extra facilities, compression stations in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And these are some of those projects that are expected to boost uh, the development of, of, of this country. However, however, uh, the problem here is that uh, it is very unlikely for Taliban to simply change the uh, entire landscape of all those risks underlying here. So despite its pledge to support TAPI, it is unlikely for the Taliban government to change the tide, especially in financing and uh, the security obstacle. Although they are no longer the security threat, but still in the region, there are a lot of other threats. I'm trying to uh, break it down uh, maybe one by one. There are the energy demand question here, the transit fee, uh, the other partners' commitment, how can they do the financing or um, some regional dispute or potential uh, sanctions and things like that. So for, for, for the region, I mean, first of all, about financing, uh, the price tag of the pipeline is kind of a 10 billion according to ADB. But if uh, all this country really wants to boost the, uh, the pipeline to full capacity, which is 33 BCM, then it will need a lot more investment, maybe double or even up to 30 or 40 uh, billion. So this means that um, uh, with the existing loan or something like that, I mean, it is not enough. And uh, Turkmenistan and other countries need more investment or funding for this project. 
But the problem here is that what we see all through this year is that there is a persistent failure to attract financing. And this results in a situation that uh, terminus time or the property project has to be scaled down, which means they can't really uh, meet the financing requirement. And why is there something happening like this? It's mainly because of the security region or uh, security problem in the region. It is a war torn region. So there are not many investors really eyeing it. And even if the banks or the investor are, are, are interested in it, and they are still facing a lot of risk because for example, Afghanistan, uh, sorry, Afghanistan is really um, kind of uh, empty or, or close to an empty place with very little infrastructure and things like that. So it will be very difficult for them to do everything from scratch. And more importantly now with a Taliban as your counterparty, it's raised a lot of questions around the political stability. Not to mention that some of the uh, government members are already under the US sanction. And more importantly is that a project of this kind required a really experienced, a large scale international company to be the leader because they have the management skills, they have the technical skills. However, what is happening is that there are not much uh, international major which are interested in this project. And we, eventually uh, the whole project is relying on the terminus time uh, state owned company, the Terminus Gas. So they are, leading, they are, leading, they are the, uh, taking a leading road. However, the company does not really have a, a, a really uh, a mature track record for handling uh, a large scale project of a similar kind. And more importantly is that um, the governance structure is quite fragmented for this project. So there will be a lot of coordinating uh, problems as we can foresee. And the second thing here is about, um, about the transit fee. So uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan are the transit country and they are going to charge some transit fee from the buyer, which is India. So they are yet to have uh, reached a final uh, agreement on how much they are going to charge. And the question whether uh, India is happy to pay it is, is quite is still unclear. So for example, let's say why India have to buy the gas from uh, Tapi. And they are only likely to buy it if the price makes sense, which means it is kind of cheaper, let's say cheaper than the LNG. Otherwise, they have very little commercial incentive for them to import gas through the tapir or to pay uh, expensive transit fee. And now if we move on to the uh, security issue all, all along the region, actually, yes, um, Taliban is some of the security concern, but still Afghanistan is still a host to other uh, militant groups as well. So there is a very slow peace process on or uh, the potential civil war are still likely to result in a lot of delays in construction or even some collateral damages to the projects in the region. And even beyond Afghanistan, Tapi is, going, uh, is expected to face uh, the security risk in Pakistan as well. So uh, the security instability in the region is still a very uh, important factor for, for, for Tapi. And on top of all this, we still have a severe sanction on the Taliban, the new government in Afghanistan. So it creates a lot of financial concern for, for the international uh, investors or the banks, because for them, there are a lot of compliance issues uh, when they have to make a decision to support, um, uh, support the, 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 the project. And this is the reason why, let's say, uh, or, or, or a, a short conclusion here is that, yes, there are little changes in Afghanistan. The Taliban, when they become the leader, it is going to ease some of those security concerns because they are considered to be the threat in the first place. However, the financial obstacle and the security, regional security issues and the price dynamics and things like that are remaining to be the obstacle. And they are very difficult for the, the Taliban to solve. And that's why the uh, TAPI pipeline is, I mean, the future is still quite unclear from my perspective. Uh, I think I will stop here. So I will allow the other presenters to have more time to present and maybe to have more Q&A. And I will hand it back to you, Chris.
Thank you. Thank. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaho, for those pertinent insights into the background challenges, uh, incentives, and the politics related to the uh, TAPI pipeline project. Um, I thought your uh, uh, points about the financial aspect as well as the security aspect were most, uh, most important. Um, I, if I may now transfer the floor to Dr. Mirza Huda, who will be speaking on the TUTAP and CASA 1000 projects. Dr. Mirza, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. And I'd just like to start off by thanking ESI and ISS for organizing this webinar. So um, my, uh, one of my research focuses is on transnational energy cooperation between South and Central Asia. And so I look at Afghanistan's energy security through that particular lens. So today I would like to divide my presentation into three parts. So firstly, I'd like to give a little bit of an overview of Afghanistan's energy security situation uh, with a focus on electricity. Then I would like to deliberate a little bit on uh, two transnational elect electricity transmission projects, the CASA 1000, the Central Asia, South Asia power project, and the TUTAP power project, which is the Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan power project. And lastly, I would like to speak a little bit about the uh, geopolitical and socioeconomic risks of these projects and how they interact with um, the Taliban regime. So firstly, Afghanistan is one of the most energy insecure countries, uh, not just in the world, but in the context of um, other countries in Central Asia. Uh, so only 35% of the population is actually connected to the grid. And um, more than 80% of the electricity consumed in the country is actually imported from Central Asian countries, uh, namely uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan. And so um, the domestic generation capacity of the country has uh, remained stagnant around 350 megawatts or so. And in the last 10 years, there has been only one energy project, domestic energy project that was developed and it was a diesel fired power plant. And because of fuel shortages, that project itself is not uh, utilized uh, enough. And um, so essentially uh, the country is suffering from severe shortages. So in the winter months, um, there is a demand that is more than 150% uh, more than uh, electricity demand in summer. And there has been a report uh, published in 2014, which stated that almost a hundred um, Afgan Afghanistan industries and factories uh, were unable to operate because of electricity shortages. And um, one of the interesting things about the Afghan electricity system is that uh, there is no national grid that integrates um, all the regional grids. So there are four separate services which uh, facilitate um, numerous electricity islands. So um, you know, a national interconnection is missing. And the reason for that is that there is um, a lack of, um, uh, lack, of there is lack of integration between um, the electricity uh, between of uh, the Central Asian countries and Afghanistan. So, um, essentially, the power systems between uh, Turkmenistan and Afghanistan and Uzbekistan and Afghanistan are asynchronous, which leads to these uh, little uh, electricity islands, which are not connected. Um, and so this sort of setup, of course, leads to certain geopolitical risks. The, the most potent one being that you're um, overly reliant on neighbors and um, the whims, the political whims of your uh, neighboring countries. So Uzbekistan is the largest exporter to, uh, uh, to Afghanistan in terms of electricity. And in 2016, uh, the Taliban actually blew up um, a transmission line between uh, Uzbekistan and Afghanistan, which led to power shortages and blackouts. And currently, there exists only one transmission corridor between Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. And so, you know, that, that, that sort of um, insecurity is continuing under the Taliban regime, although they don't have the 
um, the motivation to blow up the, the, the partner's mission now. And also in 2012, Iran closed its border with Afghanistan, which led to shortages of oil. So um, dependence on the neighbors is a serious cause of energy security concern for Afghanistan. But Afghanistan does have um, a significant energy resource endowments, as Dr. Ahmed mentioned. Uh, they have around 1.6 billion um, barrels of crude oil, um, have natural gas, uh, they have substantial um, sources of um, solar energy around 200 gigawatts and around 30 gigawatts of hydropower. Um, but unfortunately, most of these resources have not been developed, as I mentioned before. And um, several multilateral organizations and development organizations have uh, tried to um, invest in the energy infrastructure in Afghanistan, particularly through the development of the Afghanistan power sector, uh, power uh, system master plan, um, which envisions the development of uh, multiple hydropower projects in the Kunal River, um, also uh, gas projects uh, such as the Shebergan gas project and uh, coal projects as well. So the Afghanistan power sector master plan includes um, not only the domestic development of infrastructure, but also looks at how um, the development of domestic infrastructure can play a role in enhancing regional cooperation. So um, one of these uh, projects is the TUTAP project. Uh, so this envisions the, the transfer of electricity uh, from Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan to Afghanistan and Pakistan. So um, this project is, um, is unique in the sense that it, um, it will transfer electricity produced not only through hydroelectricity, but also through um, thermal energy. So Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are two countries in Central Asia have, who have excess hydroelectricity, whereas um, Afghanistan and Pakistan are countries that uh, desperately need um, energy. Um, and this is only in the, in the, in the summer months. So um, in that context, uh, TUTAP will uh, operate in, in, the, in, in the summer months with uh, Tajikistan providing hydroelectricity. And in the winter months, countries such as Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, who don't necessarily have a lot of uh, hydropower uh, resources, but they have um, all coal, oil, and gas, will provide um, electricity power through thermal energy. And uh, TUTAP is progressing really well. Um, there are um, multiple um, stages of development. Uh, so there are five stages of uh, the TUTAP project and is developed in cooperation with the ADB World Bank and other partners. So already um, transmission lines have been developed between Afghanistan and uh, Turkmenistan and Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. And uh, several um, converters, uh, converter stations are being developed in Pakistan. And there's also some um, work being done on uh, synchronizing the, the electricity grid goes between the countries. Um, and the other project being envisioned is the CASA 1000 project. Uh, and this is essentially about the transfer of hydroelectricity from uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to uh, Pakistan through Afghanistan. And uh, this project is also uh, progressing quite well. Uh, it's due to be completed in 2024 and um, several transmission towers have been set up in all four countries and um, uh, multiple levels of um, coordination and negotiations are occurring between um, the, the country partners. So the CASA 1000 and TUTAP uh, don't necessarily overlap, they actually complement. So there are some key differences between these two projects. So firstly, as I mentioned before, CASA 1000 is essentially about transferring excess hydroelectricity and only in the summer months. So uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are also countries that suffer from electricity shortages, but only in the winter months. So um, the issue here is that uh, when this ele excess electricity is transferred, um, it's actually uh, generating revenue for Kyrgyzstan and Pakistan and also um, powering economies in, in Pakistan. Um, in terms of Afghanistan, uh, under the CASA 1000, they have an option of 
either utilizing the 300 megawatts of power or they can sell this electricity to Pakistan. Um, and the CASA 1000 is independent of the Afghanistan power sector master plan. So uh, it uses completely separate uh, transmission lines. Um, on the other hand, TUTAP is actually very well integrated into the Afghanistan power sector master plan in the sense that it relies on domestic infrastructure. So the TUTAP is looked upon as uh, you know, an incentive uh, to develop Afghanistan's domestic infrastructure. And um, as I mentioned, uh, TUTAP uh, will provide power throughout the year. In the winter months, uh, the, um, uh, the fossil fuel rich uh, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan will provide uh, electricity powered by thermal energy. Um, and uh, TUTAP is also envisioned uh, in, in the context of providing Afghanistan an opportunity to transfer electricity. So uh, Afghanistan is planning to develop several hydropower projects uh, in the Kunar River. And the idea is that um, excess electricity produced in the summer months can be uh, transferred to Pakistan. So it is a source of um, potential um, export revenue for Afghanistan. Um, so in, 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 in terms of uh, progress, these, pro these projects are, um, you know, they look really good on paper. There's, uh, there's uh, substantial um, developments around infrastructure development and collaboration between uh, the different, different parties in, in, the, in the Central Asian and South Asian countries. However, um, there are various conflicts related to the development of these Projects. So hydroelectric development in any context will create environmental conflicts, and uh, particularly so in the context of Central Asia. So the five countries of Central Asia share the Amu Daria and the Sir Daria rivers, and um, there's, there's a plethora of conflicts around the sharing of these rivers. Um, and there is conflict not only between the upper riparians and the lower riparians, but uh, between um, between within the upper riparians and the lower riparians as well. So what I mean by that is um, the, the Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are upper riparian countries and they are involved in con conflicts over water. And Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan are lower riparian and they are also involved in conflicts over water. And the upper riparians and lower riparians are involved in conflicts as well. Um, so as recent as April 2021, there was a violent conflict at the Tajikistan um, Kyrgyzstan border over the um, over a shared water facility. So as you can imagine, the development of these um, huge transmission projects that utilize hydroelectricity can potentially lead to conflict. And uh, on the other side, uh, perhaps um, if these countries collaborate on mutually beneficial uh, transmission projects, maybe they can um, look at the benefits of interdependence and this can reduce conflicts. It can go both ways perhaps. Another issue is how these transmission projects affect ethnic issues in Afghanistan. So in 2016, the Hazara minority um, brought out a procession to protest the development of TUTAC. And they weren't necessarily protesting um, the, uh, the development of the project per se, but how this project would affect their interests. So um, originally the TUTAP project was meant to um, go through the Baiman province in uh, Afghanistan, uh, which uh, has um, a substantial Hazara, uh, Hazara population. And um, subsequently the route of the TUTAP was changed. And so it's no longer going through the Baiman province. And the Hazaras who are a minority and um, have uh, you know, certain grievances and have been subject to oppression feel that... Um, Dr. Mirza, if you could just wrap up in, in a minute, please. Uh, I'm sorry? It, uh, you have one minute. Oh, sorry, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so um, the Hazaras who have uh, faced uh, um, you know, several levels of discrimination uh, feel that um, the TUTAP being um, you know, um, rerouted from the Baiman means that they would miss out on some of the socioeconomic development opportunities uh, perceived to be um, you know, attached to the project. And so um, just very quickly, in terms of the Taliban takeover, the, the Taliban had a very good relationship with the Turkmen government. Um, so um, there had been multiple um, 
interaction between the Taliban and the Turkmen government uh, after the August 2021 takeover of, um, of the Taliban. Um, and this is the same for Uzbekistan. Uh, however, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan have expressed some concerns uh, regarding the uh, Taliban regime. So this provides you know, some clues as to how these projects will develop in the future. And uh, lastly, um, there are concerns about the, whether the inclusivity of these projects uh, in reference to the Hazara issue would be worse under the Taliban, um, given that uh, you know, they have been subject to uh, oppression by the Taliban as well. And as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, uh, there is the issue of international legitimacy um, of these projects uh, due to the human rights violations of the Taliban regime. And lastly, as I mentioned before, Afghan energy infrastructure had uh, come under attack by the Taliban regime in 2016. And given that the terrorist attacks by IS Khorasan, the Islamic State Khorasan in Afghanistan recently, uh, we have to consider where, uh, whether um, this terrorist group would target uh, energy infrastructure and hence undermine transnational uh, electricity uh, cooperation between South and Central Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Meza, for that detailed overview of Afghanistan's domestic power sector situation and the country's sensitivities and vulnerabilities and, and its potential. Uh, thank you also for detailing uh, the progress on the two projects and the sources of social, uh, ethnic um, and resource conflicts. Moving on to the theme of external uh, actors and regional dynamics, our first speaker on this theme is Andrew Small, uh, whose presentation will focus on China and Pakistan. Andrew, sir, you have the floor. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to join this discussion today. Um, so I'm going to cover two kind of thematic areas in this, uh, largely focused on, on, on China. Um, the context with which China is now approaching um, its uh, views on future investments in Afghanistan and the kind of immediate issues that it has um, in the, the, the short term in dealings with the, the, the new government in Afghanistan and, and what this is likely to translate into um, over, over the coming years in terms of the prospects for, for, for deeper Chinese involvement and, and, and in, in which areas. Um, so stepping back, uh, I mean, really since the Soviet invasion um, and, and even slightly before that, China's largely seen Afghanistan through a threat prism um, and seen two kinds of threat there, geopolitical threat or non-conventional threat. Um, and when it's needed to, China's been very active in trying to manage that threat. And at other times, it's intentionally limited uh, its involvement. In the 1980s, the threat perception was focused on the geopolitical threat in the shape of the Soviet Union. Um, and you saw the, the actions that China took in support of the Mujahideen. Uh, in the 90s, it was the non-conventional threat. Um, ETIM's presence in Afghanistan um, and China's dealings with the Taliban to try to address uh, that, um, which did involve uh, around the turn of the millennium, at least some modest small scale economic interactions as well. Uh, then in the 2000s, essentially you had both kinds of uh, threat. Uh, initially, um, China was sort of relieved in a certain sense that the Taliban uh, uh, leave it being driven out as a result of the US invasion. Uh, but then China was dealing with the geopolitical threat of the US presence in its backyard. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, it essentially both kinds of threat with the, 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 the insurgency taking off. Um, and China had an approach in a certain sense that was diplomatically uh, hedged, maintaining relations with the Taliban, uh, while also coordinating in, in various areas with the United States, um, but to a certain extent sitting on its hands diplomatically, um, largely until the juncture in which it thought that the US withdrawal uh, was, was going to move ahead, where it started playing a more active role on the reconciliation talks. Uh, through this window um, in the 2000s and the 2010s, China did hope that it was possible to square some of the different interests that it had, the hedged relationships that it had with, with, with a number of different actors, uh, the support that Pakistan was going to be able to extend relations with the Afghan government and relations with the United States, um, which, of course, uh, the largest uh, proposed investment, uh, the INAC copper mine, was understood uh, on the Chinese side to be uh, possible, partly because it had squared all of those different uh, political interests. Um, 
in practice, um, as we've seen both with uh, the INAC investment um, and the Amudaria oil investment, which, which went ahead on, on the premise that um, the, the North was a, a safe context for Chinese investments, um, a whole host of obstacles uh, prevented uh, either of these uh, initiatives moving ahead uh, on the scale that was was envisaged, and we've seen a substantial period of time uh, in 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 the decade that followed, essentially of, of, of different forms of slow rolling and obstacles, and and um, uh, on on the Chinese side, a, a a very high level of hesitation, not just about those projects, but then um, uh, hesitation about some of the new projects and proposals on infrastructure connections in the region that were envisaged. China has been very reluctant consistently to move ahead with any cross-border connections um, through the Wakhan Corridor uh, directly to Xinjiang. Um, it still largely wanted to maintain some level of a buffer with Afghanistan. Um, and despite the Ghani government coming in with, with a number of uh, interesting proposals uh, on cross-border infrastructure um, and some of the links to, 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 to CPEC. Um, ultimately, uh, China also slow rolled most of, most, most of those uh, proposals too. The current context is one um, in which China really did not want to see the Taliban taking power in the fashion that they did, um, particularly in the kind of emboldened way that, that they have taken power. Um, uh, uh, after kind of an outright battlefield victory, they saw the Taliban coming to power in this context as a context where they were less likely to have to moderate, to reach, con uh, to reach compromises with other political groups in the country, and they were concerned about the inspirational effect it would have on militants across uh, the region. Um, to a certain extent, the US presence was also understood as a geopolitical benefit for, for, for China, um, uh, both the US being bogged down in continental Asia, um, but also the risk in the aftermath of a US drawdown um, that China would be sucked into more active involvement at precisely the juncture in which the US was moving out to focus on the Indo-Pacific. And there's much analysis on the Chinese side that, that describes the current context that we're seeing now as a, as a trap, uh, not just a trap if China was to be involved more in, in security terms, but even certain forms of economic and political uh, involvement in the country uh, that are seen to um, involve a number of risks. Uh, China does, on the other hand, know that it needs to take a more active role now, at least diplomatically. Um, and in principle, there are contexts in which we could envisage China taking on a, a more serious economic role in a Taliban-run Afghanistan. Uh, but there are a number of conditions required for that to, to, to happen, and that will affect the speed and, and, and prospects and, and really the overall quality of relations with, with, with the Taliban. So a few of these kind of uh, preconditions that, um, that that we'd need to be fulfilled uh, before China would move ahead on kind of any meaningful scale with uh, either regional connectivity projects or um, energy and natural resource investments in Afghanistan. But first of all is Taliban's dealings with uh, ETIM, now uh, called TIP. We've seen the Taliban provide uh, certain political guarantees to China consistently over time, but the Chinese side is still not entirely sure what these will uh, amount to. Uh, the dealings that Taliban has with other groups that can pose a threat uh, to China, particularly the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, uh, the main concern that China still has on the situation in Afghanistan at the moment is regional. Um, if it comes down to it, China does not have to take uh, a more serious uh, and active economic and political role in Afghanistan. To a certain extent, they can maintain an embassy, have a few kind of modest economic and security interactions, uh, but the spillover effects in, in Pakistan in particular matter uh, a lot to China. The security situation facing CPEC in particular uh, has worsened considerably uh, in the last year and is attributed to the developments uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, there's also concerns, of course, that China has uh, about the spillover effects uh, to a lesser degree in, in, in Central Asia. The critical thing uh, beyond the handling of the Taliban's uh, relations with, with various of these groups uh, is evidently the capacity to control security in Afghanistan and achieve some level of political stability. Um, I think there is a, a different kind and quality of economic relationship that China could have uh, over a, a long arc. Um, but I think it is seen as a place where the risks to Chinese projects and, and workers there uh, are very evident. Uh, China does not just see this as a matter of the Taliban saying that they will guarantee security. Um, I think for the for the really serious uh, resource investments that could be made there, the timescale before they would yield returns 
uh, is sufficiently long that I think China sees the need for there to be a political framework that will really stick. Uh, they've seen contexts in which there's a sort of illusory level of control for, for a government uh, for a few years that then unravels um, subsequently. Um, they, they, they've, of course, this has played out for, for, for the prior round of, of economic investments that China had. And, and they understand that the threats to projects in Afghanistan are very diverse. Uh, foreign intelligence services, unhappy locals, different factions within the Taliban that become disaffected over time. They went through this experience, of course, in, in Logar, uh, where they essentially thought they did have with INAC all of the different political uh, forces um, supportive of, of, um, of the project, uh, but still faced a series of security threats, rocket attacks on, on the mine and, and so on. And of course, it is also difficult for Chinese companies to proceed uh, in a serious way in Afghanistan if there are uh, significant terrorism sanctions in place from the United States uh, and, and elsewhere. The biggest immediate concern is, of course, the immediate, uh, the short term economic picture for, for Afghanistan. Um, this, of course, means that they do, in principle, want the Taliban to kind of jump through a few uh, hoops to in, uh, attain some level of international acceptability, whether or not they care about some of the issues intrinsically. Uh, the particular stress at the moment is, is evidently on the, the central bank funds um, and soliciting uh, significant levels of, of aid that China itself is not willing to provide. Uh, we've seen very limited humanitarian support, but of course China does not do uh, large scale uh, bilateral uh, aid. Um, the forms of economic support that it would provide would largely be from um, investments, um, which uh, as I've suggested, will, will, will take some time before they could be seriously envisaged. Um, so what I would expect in the, the coming period um, is uh, first of all, some level of short-term uh, support to the new government uh, with, I think, a suggestion on the economic side that there will be uh, a lot more to come if some of the security conditions permit um, and if the government moves on some of China's political demands. Um, the forms of support in, in the short term uh, mean uh, certain forms of humanitarian aid, theoretically certain forms of financial support, depending on what goes on um, in um, the, uh, the context of things like central bank uh, assets, um, and potentially also some smaller scale investment projects um, if, 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 if the conditions permit. Um, I think on the longer term, larger scale projects, some of these are likely to be spun out. Um, I think uh, China understands the value of being seen to be the, the potential large-scale economic supporter. There is value to the fact that the Taliban uh, believe that this is the, the, the case, that they are going to be the critical actor in, in, in that sense. Um, and I think they're very happy to play along with that. Um, but I think there will be a certain amount of pretending that a lot more is going on, but again, slow rolling these projects um, until they're confident that the political and security conditions um, permit. Um, on the Belt and Road Initiative and some of the regional connectivity elements that relate to that, um, I think the picture is not dissimilar. Um, I, I think there will be some willingness to move ahead with some internal infrastructure connections, um, but I think there is still a concern on China's part that um, it's not entirely clear that it wants a country that at the moment it's still concerned could be a permissive um, hub for militants in the region to be superbly internationally uh, and regionally interconnected. Um, we still see at the moment more concern about border spillover risks than great enthusiasm on, on, on China's part um, for uh, deeper connectivity uh, plans. And I think that's going to continue until again, the picture changes. Um, I think there's a narrative at the moment that suits China, um, where in a certain sense, Afghanistan is instrumentalized to that effect. China does want to play the role on this of the coming power, uh, that China will be the kind of investor by contrast with the United States, uh, that China will be a different kind of leader. Uh, but I think the risk appetite for some of these investments um, is actually lower than it was uh, a few years ago, um, when I think there was a lot more serious discussion on, on the Chinese side about uh, uh, post-conflict reconstruction, a peace dividend, and all of these sorts of things. Um, I think what we've seen in some of the developments on the other Belt and Road uh, investments in the region, particularly the experience they're going through uh, with CPEC, uh, but the Belt and Road financing as a whole, which has obviously been papered back uh, in various ways, and where the political and risk analysis and um, uh, concerns in general have, um, have come more to the fore. Um, means that I think the willingness to, to, to push ahead 
uh, with um, the, the kind of scale of, 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 of uh, economic projects that would actually be genuinely transformative in terms of the economic picture in the country, um, I, I think are still some years away. Um, I think what China would like, of course, is that this does represent a turning point for the country, that a new government comes in, uh, stabilizes, provides security, um, and does create a framework that will make all of these things possible. I think there's no question that on regional connectivity and on the resource investments, um, there are there's considerable interest on, on, on the Chinese side, um, but they have seen a context in the country lasting for several decades, uh, which is, is has still been one of uh, war and short-term lulls um, that, that, that translate into uh, a worsening security picture again. They're still very hesitant about dealings with, with the Taliban, despite the, the, the long relationship that they've, they've, they've had with them. The constellation of the new government has, from their perspective, not been uh, a reassuring one. Um, and so I think what I would expect is that if the Taliban do not deliver in uh, all of the areas that China wants to see them deliver on um, terrorism questions, um, stability and security, capacity to provide um, a framework that China can trust in terms of the political stability in the country, which does require at least some progress um, on something that looks like political reconciliation, then I think the relationship will stay cordial, the channels will be open, China will talk about um, and be happy to see large numbers being sort of slung around um, on the investments that they're willing to make. Um, and I think they will engage quite seriously. And to some extent, even uh, before the Taliban took power, they, they had already engaged seriously in, in discussion on some of the potential projects. Um, but I think the approach that China would take um, instead uh, will be one of focusing on containing threats while continuing to leave the prospect of a larger economic relationship um, and larger set of investment ties um, as, as an ongoing incentive if the Taliban are uh, willing to deliver on the areas that China prioritizes. Um, and I'll leave things there. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that concise and uh, co comprehensive analysis of China's historical dealings and with and geopolitical considerations on Afghanistan and its view and assessment of the Taliban government and investment opportunities. I'd like to now, I'd like to now invite our final uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Pradhan, to share his thoughts on the view from India. Dr. Pradhan, please. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Esteemed chair and my fellow panelists. At the outset, let me express my thanks and gratitude to Dr. Christopher Lan and the Energy Studies Institute, National University of Singapore, for providing me this opportunity to share my views on India's perspective on Afghanistan under Taliban. I will present my views on three uh, you know, thematical issues. First is India's uh, investment in Afghanistan. Second is the transit pipeline routes and its security concerns, and third is the Pakistan-China factor in uh, you know, India's uh, uh, Afghan policy. I'm sure all will agree with me that a massive geopolitical churning is taking place in Afghanistan, suddenly made what is in the ground, I mean to say the mineral resources, less important than what is above the ground, the geopolitics that is taking place around the, you know, post uh, Afghan, I mean to say when, after the return of Taliban. The sudden withdrawal of the US and NATO forces from Afghanistan has led to the return of a radical, clerical, and fundamentalist Islamic organization, Taliban, which has certainly turned the heart of Asia as the new theater of global conflict. With Taliban, Pakistan, and China forging a deadly troika of terror and tyranny, certainly India has been placed in an awkward and unusual position. Why I'm saying so? Because uh, since November 2001, with overthrow of the Taliban regime by the US-led coalition forces, India has emerged as an important development partner of Afghanistan and undoubtedly its most important regional partner. If you look, the total Indian investment in Afghanistan is close to 3 billion US dollars, which include important infrastructural projects like the 218 kilometer long Jaran's Dalaram Highway, the laying of the electricity transmission lines from Uzbek border to Kabul over the Hindu Kush mountains as part of the multi-country, multi-agency Northeast power system, and the Afghan-India friendship dam, widely known as the Salma Dam, 
on the hari road that produces around 42 megawatt of power besides irrigating more than 75000 hectares of land in fact india's external affairs minister uh, mr s jayashankar in afghanistan conference in geneva uh, in november 2020 had stated that no part of afghanistan has been left untouched by india with a number of development projects undertaken across all the provinces and day before yesterday while addressing the g20 summit uh, our prime minister mr narendra modi reiterated that india is involved in more than 500 developmental projects in afghanistan and is committed for the development of afghanistan however among all possibly the most important strategic projects for both india and afghanistan is the 218 km long jarang dalaram highway built by the indian border roads organization at a cost of 150 million us dollar jarang is located close to afghanistan border with iran and the road there goes along the khas road river to the dalaram to the northeast of jarang where it connects to a ring road that links kandar in the south ghazni and kabul in the east mazar-e sharif in the north and herat in the west with pakistan denying india overland access for trade with afghanistan this highway is certainly of strategic importance to india as it provides an alternative route into landlocked afghanistan through iran chabahar port india in fact had transported 75000 tons of wheat through chabahar to afghanistan during this covid pandemic period and importantly why india is so worried among the 300 indians Uh, you know engineers and workers who worked alongside uh, afghan to build the road uh, around 11 indians and 129 afghans they have lost their lives during this uh, construction okay attributed to terrorist attacks and uh, accident as per the statement of ministry of external affairs government of india the afghan government also blamed the pakistani army isi and its well known proxies the haqqani network the laskar e toiba besides taliban for these deadly attacks another significant project funded by india is the chintala substation a terminal link of afghanistan's northeast power system located near afghanistan's capital kabul the substation imports power from uzbekistan to kabul this substation in fact supplies additional power from the 220 kV pule khumri to kabul double circuit transmission line passing over the salong range at an altitude of 3800 meter and the transmission line is 202 km long built by power grid corporation of india with the goal of light kabul construction of the chitmal substation began in 2005 and was completed in 2009 and the cost of project was around 83 million dollar in addition two more substations have been committed to be built by india for local electricity distribution in afghanistan at uh, chorikar and dosi however uh, the projects are uncertain at the moment because of the return of taliban uh, to in uh, afghanistan and uh, you know considered one of the largest dam in afghanistan the salma dam which is in the harat chisti sharif district provides irrigation uh, and electricity to 100 and 1000 of families in the province the popular dam has a water storage capacity of 640 million cubic meters and an irrigation capacity of uh, now at the moment is more than 2 lakh acres of farmland from chisti sharif district of harat to the zulfikar area on the iran border in fact the salma dam has been india's most expensive project in afghanistan in the recent years this hydropower project and irrigation project was inaugurated in 2016 and is also known as the afghan india friendship dam in addition at the 2020 geneva conference india had declared that she had set an agreement with afghanistan for the construction of the satut dam in the kabul district the dam was supposed to provide safe drinking water to 2 million residents our external affairs minister mr jay shankar has also announced that the start of 100 community development projects for 80 million dollar at that conference meanwhile last year india has pledged 1 million dollar for another aga khan heritage project the restoration of bala hisar fort in the south of kabul uh, whose origin dates back to 6th century ad india had also gifted 400 houses 200 mini buses to afghan for public transportation a 105 utility vehicles for municipalities 285 military vehicles for the afghan army and 10 ambulances for public hospitals in five cities were also provided by india afghan national carrier aryana had also received three air india aircraft when it had restarted its operation importantly the afghan parliament in kabul was built by india with an estimated cost of 90 million dollar it became operational in 2015 
our prime minister narendra modi had inaugurated the building further india has been instrumental in building hospitals and clinics in the border provinces of badakhan balkh kandahar khost kunar nangahar nimroj nuristan patia and patida with taliban now in government and the hakanis in dominance the questions are bound to be asked as to how india proposes to safeguard this investment and assets built over the past two decades coming to the you know transit pipeline routes you know there is so much in stake for india with regard to the transit pipeline network such as tap and ipi my previous speakers have already you know or uh, said the light on this the turkmenistan afghanistan pakistan india pipeline which is around uh, 1814 km trans alte natural gas pipeline running across four countries also known as peace pipeline and trans afghan pipeline uh, it will uh, it, it begins its journey from turkmenistan traverses through afghanistan to enter into you know pakistan and india a special a special consortium known as the tapi pipeline consortium tpcl was incorporated in november 2014 by the turkmen gas which is the majority you know stakeholder with 85% afghan gas enterprise with 5% interstate gas system of pakistan with 5% and uh, gail india the gas authority of india limited with 5% to execute the 10 billion you know power project uh, 10 billion project with uh, you know the turkmen gas leading the consortium you know estonian link ceremony was also held to commemorate the start of the construction of the turkmen afghanistan's uh, you know section of the tapi gas pipeline in december 2015 in meri in turkmenistan near the galkanis gas field the investment agreement for the development of the tapi project was signed by the four countries in february 2016 the ceremony marking the beginning of construction of the afghanistan pakistan section of the pipeline was held in february 2018 designed to serve for 30 years the pipeline is expected to commence operation in 2020 is now facing uncertainty it is expected to transport 33 billion cubic meters of natural gas a year but due to the developments that are taking place in afghanistan and the you know hostile attitude of pakistan towards india has been a problem for this operation of this project similarly the ipi iran pakistan india gas pipeline project also known as the peace pipeline is under construction It is around 2,775 kilometers long pipeline that would run through Afghanistan to deliver natural gas from Iran to India and Pakistan. Proposed by Abta Bahamut Khan of Pakistan and R.K. Pachuri of India, the pipeline received preliminary record in 1995. In 1999, India signed the agreement. The project supposed to be materialized by December 2017 couldn't do so due to the American sanctions on Iran, India's security concerns originating from militant operating from Afghanistan and Pakistan. in addition to this it should be noted here that apart from the you know fuel resources there are also non fuel resources that afghanistan is saudi arabia of mineral resources specifically lithium taliban regime now regains its control over those vast natural resources of afghanistan worth up to uh, you know it is being said that 3 trillion dollars as per the estimate of usgs united states Geological geological survey with over 1400 mineral fields uh you know it has vast uh, you know deposits of hydrocarbons which includes uh, oil gas and coal my previous speakers have already said on this lead limestone gemstone copper iron gold uranium bauxite you know rare earth lithium chromium sulfur all uh, you know among others as per the estimate of usgs total copper resources of afghanistan as of 2019 is about 57.7 million metric tons at current price the value of this resources should be around 560 billion dollar with many discoveries on the afghan uh, you know it may rank among the top 5 copper reserves in the world the largest copper deposit which also contains significant amount of cobalt is the ironak ore body located about 30 kilometers southeast of kabul the high grade portion of the total ironic deposit is estimated uh, to be around 11.3 million metric tons of copper uh you know without going much into it um, you know dr pradhan uh, Yes, Dr. Pandey. Sorry, I, you you have. I will take two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know the reason is why I am touching upon this, upon this mineral resources because uh, you know both India and China they are keenly interested to invest on these mineral resources. In fact, India Indian Consortium has won the right to develop the Hajigak. You know, uh, and uh, similarly. the mcc the metallurgical corporation of china and the jianxis copper corporation has won over the right to develop this uh, mess ionic uh, you know uh, copper mine but um, uh, 
uh, after the initial start, China has stopped the war due to security reasons and from the agreement with Afghanistan as Oranius. Right? Finally, coming to lithium, as you all know that lithium is the new oil. Right? It is plenty in Afghanistan and mainly in the Nuristan province. And many believe that it has more than 21 million tons of lithium. Okay. While the world is solidifying its environmental agenda, global economics are moving towards decarbonizing their energy system to increasing the share of renewable among other efforts for green future, the lithium deposits of Afghanistan will be of immense use for the global energy crunch the world is confronting at this moment. Europe is heading for a Russian winter with acute shortage of gas. China is closing down factories due to shortage of coal and is heading for a massive power disruption. And India is facing skyrocketing oil and gas prices. In such a situation, the lithium, uranium, and other fuel and non-fuel resources of Afghanistan certainly will provide the world with alternatives. But the larger question remains, who is interested to invest in Afghanistan under Taliban and what about the security of my security aspect? As far as India's approach to Afghanistan under Taliban is concerned, she is deeply concerned and is adopting a very cautious approach to the developments taking place in and around Afghanistan. In the muscle memory, we can see many of its development projects have been subjected to multiple attacks. Scores of Indians, including the high rank embassy officials, army doctors, construction workers, engineers and security personnel, fell victim to such attacks. The government of Afghanistan has blamed Pakistan, ISI and its proxies, uh, besides Taliban for these attacks. With Taliban now in government, India's infrastructure development projects and energy transportation networks undoubtedly face security concerns. Although we are committed for the development in Afghanistan, unless and until there is a security guarantee in Afghanistan, I don't think any energy or non-energy project would you know, commence. If you, if you look at the recent developments that are taking place, both the involvement of TTP, or the you know, Uyghur Muslims in the recent attack in Afghanistan, I believe even China will not be interested to invest in Afghanistan. With this, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pradhan, uh, for outlining India's extensive interests and investments in, in uh, Afghanistan prior to the Taliban's takeover, as well as the unusual uh, predicament uh, facing India and its strategic and risk calculations. Uh, if I could move to offer the floor to Dr. Len for his comments as the discussant, please. Dr. Len. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, the presentations were all very thorough. We have a very systematic coverage of the topics from different angles. And I think the so a key takeaway for me, based on what I've heard, is the biggest focus and preoccupation uh, as espoused by the presenters is with regards to the stability of Afghanistan, right? That is the starting point. Without stability and certainty uh, with regards to how the Taliban is going to run the country, whether it's able to manage the country uh, with its bureaucracy and administration also, uh, this will you know, uh, help uh, external actors uh, assess uh, and define their relationship uh, with this uh, regime, right? And um, I thought before I go down to questions for the individual presenters, uh, it would be also useful to sort of step back a little bit to set the context to understand where Afghanistan is in a global context and why all these things uh, matter, right? And I think that um, you can trace the current situation actually back to the unfolding legacy of the Soviet Union collapse. Right. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Central Asian states became independent, and that served as the basis to diversify from Russian dependence, particularly uh, talking about energy exports. So you can see Turkmenistan actively trying to find new markets uh, to sort of break away from uh, sort of Russian control of the former Soviet Union space. Uh, so we start with uh, them exporting to China. And then, of course, there is this uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, right? And then with the end of the Cold War, 
uh, we face a new form of threats. It's not just about traditional threats between two uh, superpowers. We are looking at the rise of uh, Islamic extremism and the challenge of terrorism from non-state actors. So that's where Afghanistan, Afghanistan got pulled into this whole uh, uh, situation uh, with the 9-11 attacks on the US. The Americans entered the country to deal with Osama bin Laden. So that was the immediate objective. And then that turned gradually into some kind of nation building project based very much on liberal ideals. And we see in uh, just very recently, I wouldn't say that it's a completely failed project. Uh, it has brought about benefits, but uh, ultimately, uh, the new government that's being supported by the West uh, is not able to stand its own ground, right? And this American withdrawal came at a very critical juncture in international politics, where the new focus in terms of threat perspective uh, by the Americans is very much on the Chinese, right? So that's at the strategic level. And then because I'm from the Energy Studies Institute, I've got to talk a bit about energy. So, you know, uh, all these things are happening at the time when we're talking about the low carbon energy transition. So there's this new growing emphasis away from fossil fuels, uh, away from coal, uh, gas as a kind of bridge between, you know, very dirty fossil fuels and uh, clean renewable energy syst systems. Right. And with that also came the growing emphasis on power generation. And that's why there is interest also, besides the gas pipeline, on a sort of a regional electricity uh, grid. Right. And then the other thing that sort of strikes me is this growing international emphasis on connectivity. So we are talking a lot about cross-border transnational initiatives. In the context of Afghanistan, we talk about the pipeline and the electricity grid. Uh, we talk about the potential of the Belt and Road. Uh, we talk, well, we heard the last speaker speak about India's role. Um, if all of this had succeeded, or if all of these are to succeed, I think the region that Afghanistan is part of part of you know uh, Central and South Asian region, it would really help the region flourish, right? And right now, the biggest uncertainty, of course, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is the stability of Afghanistan. And that has uh, implications on uh, the engagement of these external parties. So coming to questions for the panelists, uh, I will run through them one by one. Uh, first question is, uh, for Taho, uh, I'll start with a remark. I think it's very interesting that we see a reverse situation. In the past, um, with the previous Afghan government, you have external partners that are willing, but the Taliban being the spoiler. But now we see Taliban being willing, but the external parties not being that interested or feeling uh, uh, confident anymore about those projects. And another inter interesting comparison, I'm just thinking aloud, is if you think about the history of this pipeline, it's been in the making for years, probably decades, I think it was from the mid 1990s onwards. And then you compare that to the Central Asia China pipeline, right? An agreement was signed in 2006, construction started in 2007, 2008, and then it became, I mean, the first pipeline was operational by 2009. So that's a very useful contrast about the state of development, especially if China is able to enter into the game and become a serious player, right? They, they can make things happen, right? So, so my question for you, uh, Kaho, is uh, with the pipeline project stalling, uh, who do you think are the biggest uh, winners and who's the biggest loser? Second question for Mirza. Again, a very interesting, comprehensive 
presentation on the two major uh, sort of electricity project. Um, my question for you then is, uh, assuming that these projects are going ahead, maybe at slower speed, do you think the Taliban government and administration would actually have the technical competency to operate these projects? Because, you know, the, ex the uh, sort of outside experts have left and um, you also see a brain drain of all the, you know, very much competent uh, Afghans. Those who could leave uh, have probably left or would be planning to leave. So that's my question for you. Third question is for Andrew. Uh, your presentation was really excellent as well. Very thorough. Um, but one thing I didn't hear you speak about, I may have missed it, is uh, the role of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or its potential role in stabilizing Afghanistan. Uh, do you think China has a role to play in that regard? Um, Afghanistan is just an observer, but you know, if there is an international platform where Afghanistan would have a chance to be at the table, I think most likely it would be the SEO. So maybe you can share a bit more about your thoughts on this. Uh, and then you say that uh, if the relationship with Afghanistan doesn't work out, uh, the relationship with China will be cordial. Um, but at the same time, um, China cannot afford chaos in Afghanistan because although the border is very limited, uh, it sort of neighbors a very sensitive region for China, which is you know, Xinjiang. And of course, the concern is the, uh, the terrorist threats or the uh, threats that uh, the Chinese see uh, that may come from Afghanistan uh, infiltrating into uh, China. So, you know, if you talk about the border of China from the east side, you have North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Vietnam, India, they're all having issues and challenges like either with China or within their own countries, which poses as a border instability for the Chinese. And then now you add to that is the uh, Afghan, uh, Afghanistan. So beyond cordial, don't you think China has a very strong stake in ensuring stability and working with whichever government comes into play? Okay, so final question. Uh, it's for Dr. Pradhan. Uh, you spoke a lot about India's engagement. Uh, very interesting. Uh, they are all quite new to me. I don't cover the India perspective much, uh, but uh, what I sense is a lot of this is actually underreported, right? And um, the, the thing that struck me is you focus a lot on the economic aspect of uh, India-Afghanistan engagement. But what about the strategic level? Does India see any strategic value uh, or strategic importance in Afghanistan uh, in the context of it being a regional power in South Asia? So, uh, yeah. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. I will hand this back to the chair. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Lin. Um, so I'd like to invite first uh, Dr. Kaho to uh, respond to the question of uh, who are the winners and losers um, in, in the current situation in Afghanistan, especially uh, with the stalling of the uh, pipeline project? Yeah, thank you for the question and uh, all, all those uh, comments. I think the, uh, the WP pipeline is a really a mega project, a transnational one. So there are so many stakeholders, I mean, in this project or in the, in the entire region. So if we try to kind of narrow down with a winner and loser category, maybe we can uh, try to look at it from a supply and demand uh, perspective. Let's say if the pipeline doesn't go through, then of course the biggest loser will be Turkmenistan because they are desperate to 
export the gas or use it as a way to diversify their export. And at the same time, let's say Afghanistan and uh, a little bit maybe Pakistan as well, they are also uh, expecting the uh, transit fee, especially for Af Afghanistan. And as well, they are uh, trying to tap on this, I, I mean, especially for Afghanistan, they are trying to tap on this mega project to showcase their investment environment or maybe even bring in more hot money uh, in, into, into the country as a, as a way to boost their kind of uh, development. So they are the key countries suffering from the current situation of the Tafti Pilot being kind of uh, a long delay and postponement and things like that. But I, I won't say there will be kind of a, a, a winner, but maybe someone who are um, going to be benefit from it. So countries like, um, I mean, the Tapi, let's say if it is a really a successful one, then it will simply change the entire gas supply landscape in South Asia and also in Central Asia. Because, I mean, as a, from an investor perspective, we won't we are not expecting unlimited money injecting into the region. Let's say if someone invests in a TAPI, then this means that they are going to uh, uh, deprioritize some other projects in the region. Or, they are, or let's say if India have a lot of gas from TAPI, then maybe they are not that willing to import so much LNG. It, it is a lot expensive. So it will simply change the whole dynamic there. So if let's say if TAPI is not going through, it is uh, keep being postponed. Then other gas supply in the region, they will see that this is a, still a good uh, uh, chance for them to expand. Let's say if you put it in this way, if you look at, let's say Russia, they are also a major gas supplier in the region. So if TAPI doesn't go, uh, go well, then a lot of other buyers may continue to buy the gas from Russia. For example, let's say China. If they want to import more gas from Turkmenistan or they want to uh, import more gas from Russia, they can import from both. It will take a lot of time or it is a, a question of their appetite. So this means that uh, other suppliers in the region, including Russia or even Iran or Iraq, a lot of them will still enjoy their uh, existing advantage in, 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 uh, from, from this perspective. So I won't say there will be a winner uh, in this situation. Maybe someone will can uh, can maintain the advantage, but definitely Turkmenistan or Afghanistan who are desperate to push for the project for some uh, fresh money or long term investment or development need or things like that, they are going to be uh, the, the loser, and this is quite unfortunate. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if we could uh, just uh, move to Dr. Mirza. If you could please respond uh, to some of um, Dr. Lin's comments, uh, particularly about how the Taliban, um, does it have the technical competency uh, now that um, so many of the contractors, um, so many of the able citizens have left. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. And thank you, Dr. Len, for, that very, uh, for raising that very important point. Um, I think it was Dr. Um, Andreas Bolta who recently mentioned that energy systems are socio-technical socio systems. You know, they're not just technical systems. Um, so that raises the importance of uh, hu human resources and uh, we've all seen the harrowing scenes of um, Afghanistan, Afghanistani citizens trying to leave the country um, following the takeover of the, the, the Taliban. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers of um, energy experts and energy bureaucrats who left the country, um, but uh, certainly the international organizations involved in um, facilitating these transnational electricity projects are aware of the need for human resources. They probably did not foresee uh, the, uh, the rise of the Taliban regime and its impact on energies and um, energy experts and energy related um, human resources and bureaucrats. Um, but if, since you mentioned energy transition, um, I would just like to look at this issue of um, missing 
technical expertise from a broader perspective. So um, currently there are millions of people working in the coal industry in China and India, and energy transition is um, you know, advancing at an at a unprecedented pace in both these countries. And this raises the question of what will actually happen to uh, you know, people who work in, in the coal industry. Um, and uh, we're looking at uh, retraining and um, providing technical expertise to a, you know, a wide range of, of um, people who work in traditional energy industries. Um, so um, I, I, I would say that um, this is a very, very serious issue, uh, you know, not only from the perspective of Afghanistan, but also uh, wider Central and South Asian regions. And uh, international organizations should um, try and see how they can ramp up uh, human resources in uh, energy industries. Um, but one of the issues that would definitely impact um, beyond just the numbers of experts in the energy industry in Afghanistan is the composition. So uh, one of the issues with energy transition is that there are very few women leaders in uh, renewable energy companies. Um, Irina brought out a study, I think, in um, 2020, uh, which highlighted the lack of uh, women in the renewable energy industry in general and uh, women leaders in particular. And of course, uh, given the nature of the Taliban regime, um, we can't really foresee a large role for women in these uh, transnational electricity projects, which is of course concerning as well. Um, so I, I hope I've managed to answer some of the questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for um keeping things uh, quite concise. Um, I just want to pass the floor to Andrew. So uh, Dr. Lin talked about the role of the SEO and its potential um, for, Ch for China to, to play a more active role, uh, as well as will China uh, intervene in the, if the threat of chaos uh, is likely to spill over. Is there an in, in, in to, is there a sort of an interventionist kind of agenda in, in such a situation? Uh, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Um, so on the first part of this, the the SCO, um, I think it is clearly true that there is a it, in in one sense a kind of heightened emphasis on regionalization of the approaches that are being taken on, on, on the Chinese side. I, I mean, I, I think we're now in a context in which there is an understanding that more effort needs to be placed on getting various specific powers, some of, all of whom are SEO members, lined up. Um, I think the subgroupings are the critical part of that, which has, of course, often been the case with, with, with the SEO. There are um, initiatives or approaches that are pursued through sort of you know a, a critical subgroup that can then in the right circumstances be badged as part of the SCO um, and I think that will continue to be true on on Afghanistan I mean I think uh, in particular obviously at the moment the the Russia Pakistan China kind of coordinating framework um, is is an important one. Um, the SEO will be kind of a, a, a stage and a forum and a context for some of these, um, for certain meetings with Afghanistan and the, and, and the new government in the right circumstances to, to take place. But um, I, I think there's gonna be a fair amount of the political action that then you know, is, is constructed through, as, as we've seen on a lot of the uh, efforts that China's made um, on, on Afghanistan, they pick, groups of three countries, four countries, two countries, drive the kind of political process through that, and then enlarge in the right circumstances. And the SEA will be one of the structures to, through which they end up enlarging it to. But I think it's also striking at the moment when we're looking at you know, the immediate economic crunch that Afghanistan is facing, the continued emphasis that Wang Yi and, uh, and others are still placing on the West coming in to provide certain forms of support. The level of economic commitment to deal with the short-term um, situation, which can have obviously have considerable longer-term ramifications, is still, it's what the US is doing, central bank assets, 
aid, all of these sorts of things. The stress is still being placed on, yes, there's things the region can do, but also you have to take responsibility and step in on, on some of these fronts. The willingness to fully own it regionally would involve I think taking on a certain level of economic commitment, for instance, that, that the China is not willing to, to, to do. And this then goes to the second question, which is what level of, what was the hierarchy of risks and what level of involvement is China willing to take on? Um, I think there is still a view that um, going back to this question of the, the, the border itself, that the threats in Afghanistan can be contained in Afghanistan as, as far as possible. There's a reason not to develop the cross-border infrastructure. Um, that border is about as locked down as it, as it gets. Um, I, I, I think there is still a view that in, in certain respects, the direct anything direct um, in, in terms of immediate spillover to, to Xinjiang, notwithstanding everything that's going on in Xinjiang, that would, would, would um, would make it very difficult for there to be um, any kind of, uh, even, even for people that were to get into Xinjiang through other routes, Central Asia and Tajikistan has, has tended to be China's concern in that regard. Um, I think the sense is that the, the, the direct, the Wakhan Corridor route continues to function as a buffer. Um, the concern I think is rather, uh, although that has to be, there has to be attentiveness to that, um, wider re the, the threats to Chinese, um, uh, projects and personnel in other locations, which we have already seen, of course, particularly the Dasu attack, you know, one of the worst attacks on Chinese personnel um, in, in, in recent history, probably in the history of the China-Pakistan relationship. And so I think there is a containing threats from Afghanistan in, in regional terms. Um, but then there is a what can China do about it question where some of the things that in principle they could do about it, I think are seen to be, there are greater risks to deeper involvement that mean that they would prefer in certain respects to step back and have others take on certain responsibility. I think they expect Pakistan to do quite a lot um, in, in this regard. I think they, they expect a certain amount of ownership for the outcome to come from uh, the, the, the Pakistani side. Um, but if you go through what China can do, whether it's security involvement, substantial economic involvement at this stage, you go down the list of things and in some cases intervening or taking a more active role, I think is seen to be a greater risk than stepping back, certainly being active diplomatically in, in, in certain respects. But I think the risks in Afghanistan, even kind of chaos in Afghanistan, is seen to be a problematic, bad outcome, but one that can potentially be managed in terms of the immediate cross-border kind of spillover elements and that there are others that will need to step up in certain respects. I mean, we are already seeing China take on a much more substantial political role, diplomatic role than was the case in the past. I think that will that will stick. But then there are some of these other dimensions, um, certainly on the security side, but even on certain forms of the economic involvement, that I think they are still quite concerned to to, to limit. And, and I think that will that will stick. That those are the bigger risk and the bigger threat and trap um, is I think understood to be the kind of making the mistake of other great powers of the past of saying, here is a set of problems to manage here, here are a set of threats, so we need to step up in a much more active way, be much more deeply involved, um, and, and ultimately the uh, a sort of contained, um, limited uh, view of the role is, is seen to be um, uh, a, a, a less risk, uh, pose, pose fewer risks to Chinese strategic interests. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I might move to Dr. Pradhan um, on the point that uh, Dr. Len raised about the strategic importance of Afghanistan. But if I could, um, since we're um, almost, we've got about 10, 15 minutes or so, I wanted to combine perhaps some of the audience questions in there as well. Um, the picture in Afghanistan looks somewhat grim. Um, if Afghanistan, for whatever reason, falls through, is Iran a viable alternative link between South and Central Asia uh, for energy? Um, so for you, Dr. Pradhan, I wanted to know, so on the one hand, we have what's Afghanistan's strategic importance, but on the other hand, can India uh, afford to get close to Iran now that it has quite a close relationship with the US. Uh, thank you, Imran. And um, thank you, Dr. Len, for the you know, insightful question, strategic engagement with uh, Afghanistan uh, from Indian side as a regional power. 
uh, let me tell you you know if you go to history the history suggests that whoever was uh, you know kabul developed the you know lead of uh, developing good relations with india maybe because of political and economic reasons but given the geopolitical location of afghanistan at the heart of asia geostrategically afghanistan is very very important for india also because india's national security is closely connected with afghanistan but however we need to understand india also has to grapple with a lot of limitations the first limitations comes from rising terrorism over there the political instability that is marked because of the you know rising islamic fundamentalism second thing the limitation comes from pakistan's influence over the region being a islamic state it is easy for pakistan to influence the region in you know in comparison to india the third thing comes the chinese support to pakistan because of which pakistan plays a larger role in comparison to india in the region however whenever there is a civilian government the relationship between india and afghanistan has always been good if you look at the muscle memory also whether you talk about the najibullah government whether you talk about karzai or you know the uh, uh, as of government in all this india's relations were very good diplomatically and otherwise also but whenever there is a you know non civilian government particularly whether you talk about taliban one or the present taliban relations were not that good but uh, uh, we cannot completely take it out that uh, india's relation even under the talibans were not good because if you look at the present taliban regime in spite of all provocation from pakistani side they are refuting to link afghanistan crisis with uh, kashmir and they want to develop good relations with india but the limitations as, as i told you that uh, you know new delhi uh, you know entry to Af- afghanistan either goes through moscow or goes through tehran that is the limitation i believe because somewhere it is being encircled by both pakistan and uh, to a greater extent china also you know coming to the iran question let me tell you historically iran and india were good friends okay even today they exhibit you know they share very good relations but the problem with india is india is too idealistic its foreign policy is still that uh, you know governed by you know or uh, what i say is a more liberal tradition than the realist tradition our closeness with america may be one reason that we are losing a good friend era okay and um, i believe if we will maintain you know a kind of distance with america because now a day we are entering into a post american world order i hope iran will be very you know keen to have relations with india because uh, india also you know importing lot of uh, you know energy from iran also it, it is contributing around 12% of india's energy exp- you know import so i believe that uh, iran would be keen to develop relations with india and uh, nowadays since uh, you know because of the pakistan factor and taliban in afghanistan iran is only the gateway for india into central asia so i believe for uh, you know in that way uh, iran holds key to india's uh, you know entry into central asia thank you thank you so much um we've got a few questions regarding uh regional external actors one thing i wanted to ask if i could uh, was um uh, russia's expressed a, a lot of interest in tapi and kasa uh projects um russian foreign minister um sergey lavrov uh, expressed his interest in aligning sort of the energy infrastructure of central and south asia um i was wondering if uh, either dr skaho dr hudo or dr len even um how would it, how how would uh, sort of the south asian states look at Ru- russian involvement um and if there is russian involvement uh, in these two projects how would it shape the projects itself um uh maybe uh, i am happy to uh, start first or and if others have more comments uh, feel free to, to join um, from south asian countries of perspective i would say the russian involvement is not ideal is mainly because in order to maximize the benefit or the interest of south asian south asian countries or southeast asian countries then there would be ideally to have as much as supplier as possible so this means that if russia is also involving in tapi or kind of kind of have a very a, a, a bigger hand on it then this means that a lot of the supplier are being dominated by one single supplier 
because Russia is also trying to export the gas through other means to South Asia, Southeast Asia, and, and so on. So if it is happening like this, then I would not say it is good for South Asia. Instead, the competition between or among the suppliers would be the most ideal situation for uh, South Asian countries. But at the same time, for, for Turkey, if, um, if, if uh, let's say Russia or China or whatever, a, big, a bigger energy company is interested in the project with the management skill, with the uh, technical skills, then it is a good sign for the product because at the moment I don't see uh, the, the, pro- the companies involved are really capable to handle such a mega project and they need some external uh, support from Russia, from, from China or, or, and, and so on. Yeah, that's, that's my uh, few cents. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mirza. Um, hi, so I just wanted to mention that, um, yes, certainly Russia is quite, um, you know, uh, possessive about, um, you know, any kind of external influence in its in what it considers its uh, area of influence. However, uh, there has been considerable uh, cooperation between uh, Central Asian countries, Russia and China. Um, in, uh, uh, in, for instance, the Russia-China pipeline, uh, sorry, the, the Central Asia-China pipeline. So the Turkmen portion of the Central Asia-China pipeline was actually developed by uh, a company that was formerly part of Gazprom, the Russian uh, state-owned uh, gas company. And also the uh, Kazakh portion of the China-Central Asia pipeline is actually used by Russia to transfer um, oil from Siberia through the Russia-Kazakhstan um, and uh, Turkmenistan uh, pipeline. Uh, so there are various overlaps in interest when it comes to uh, um, you know, pipeline projects between China, Russia, and Central Asia. Um, so I think uh, to say that Russia will um, uh, completely object the Tapi pipeline is probably uh, not um, not 100% correct. Um, there may be avenues for uh, cooperation, but there would, of, of course, be some geopolitical wranglings as well. But there is evidence of Russia being uh, forthcoming in uh, encouraging Central Asian countries to reach beyond uh, traditional spheres of influence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if I could bring in, uh, we're almost out of time, so I might ask my uh, last question to uh, perhaps Andrew. Um, what is Islamabad's calculation in uh, uh, increased Russian involvement? And I also wanted to ask, as these regional um, platforms uh, becoming, become an increasing point of negotiation, on things like energy, is that something that may facilitate um, the gradual recognition of the, the Taliban? Uh, what, what would be uh, some of those um, contentions that, that might be present in that? Um, so on the Russia question, I mean, you, you have two layers to this, the Russia-Pakistan relationship and, and, and Russia's relationship with, with the Taliban. Um, and so, I mean, of course, there has been this sort of effort over the last few few years to, um, partly helped by, by, by China, actually, to uh, rebalance the Russian relationship in, in, in the region um, uh, of course, the traditional partnership with with, with India um, continues, but um, I think the, the the sense of that that there needs to be um, at least a sort of upgrade in Russia Pakistan ties, which which we've seen in 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 various different aspects. Um, even if there are some, in theory, understood limitations to. To, to, to that um, has been something that has really accelerated over, over the last um, few years. And the, the Afghanistan question then becomes one of the areas in, in, in which I think there is understood to be real advantage um, on multiple sides to have closer Russian involvement. But, but Russia as well, of course, um, you know, given the, the, the legacy of their involvement was in a it's, you know, very different place when we were dealing with this, this scenario in Afghanistan before, there's, there's been the push to fix 
um, ties with the Taliban um, in, in the last few years and to be a kind of actor in a different way in, 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 in Afghanistan in, in a way that it had been kind of um, uh, out of the political picture in, 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 in certain respects and, and certainly not in a position to, um, uh, to have the quality of relations with the new government that's, that's, that's there. Um, uh, so uh, you, you do have now this the kind of possibility between Pakistan, Russia and China. I mean, if you, if you look back at the late 90s, Pakistan was having to go to China alone for sort of potential help for the Taliban in things like the UN Security Council, Sanctions Committee, all of these sorts of things. Now you have a bit more of a double act that can take place between China, take recognition question is something that can be navigated in, in some respects between some of these um, actors. And, and again, I, I think those three are the kind of crux actors when it comes to uh, ultimately the, the, the recognition question. I mean, I think for now it's understood that there is still some benefit to the, the, the leverage that is provided to you know, maintaining the the level of political exchanges and, 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 and dealings with the Taliban, but still holding back um, on 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 the recognition uh, issue until some of the sort of demands and thresholds have been crossed. Uh, again, it's it's still I think understood by by all of those parties that it will be advantageous if if the Taliban can do enough that it gets kind of a wider framework of, of, of political and diplomatic recognition, um, particularly, again, when it comes to these economic questions, as long as the Taliban is in the place that they're, they're in right now, uh, the economic picture is, is going to be um, disastrous. Um, and the only way of getting, if, if, if there is an excessively early move to then recognize the government, um, and um, uh, the, the, there is an expectation that there is now no longer any need to go through any of these sorts of processes, um, then I think the expectation would instead be that some of these other actors, Chinese and others, would, would have to provide that form of economic support, which they're not willing to do. And it, it's still going to be very difficult as long as some of the sanctions uh, are, are in place that even if they were kind of willing to step in, not again, so much on the UN side as as much just what OFAC, um, US Treasury is, is able to, to do in that regard. It is still a problem that various of these actors are essentially on uh, uh, terrorism lists, terrorism financing lists, and all, all of these sorts of things. So I think we'll, you know, all sorts of things are going on by default anyway, and we have an acting government and all of these sorts of things. I mean, there is a for, for, for now, there is the, the, the process of engagement and, and, and the process of, of figuring out um, some of these longer term issues can still take place with the government that's, that's in power. But until you get past this short term hurdle, which is, you know, the extremely straightened economic conditions that are there, which, which require um, fixing um, uh, relations with a group that go beyond that uh, immediate circle, um, I think there are still going to be some reasons to, to, to hold back. Um, on, on, on the recognition uh, issue. I, th I think that's, that's going to be different questions at, at stake for that rather than, you know, the, the, the question of this government's involvement in regional groupings and, and, and things. I think the calculations are going to be, uh, are going to relate to, to, to some of these wider questions. Thank you so much uh, on drawing out the nuances of that. Um, I believe uh, we've gone a few minutes over uh, and that's pretty much all that we have time for, uh, I wanted to extend a very warm thank you to our esteemed panelists uh, and to Dr. Lin and the ESI for all their help in putting this event together. Uh, if I could now hand the floor to Claudia to give the concluding uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists for the engaging discussion and to Dr. Imran and Dr. Lin for chairing and moderating the session today. To the audience, we thank you for participating in our events and we look forward to seeing you at future events as well. Thank you everyone. Have a very good evening or good day uh, wherever time zone you are in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.